Now I think that brings us to the fundamental management equation and here it is the return on capital uh, be greater than the cost of capital. Uh, that should be guiding the decision making of all private sector corporate executives. What I'm going to do is put them in a divisional fraction and I want the return on capital, which is the numerator, to be greater than the cost of capital, which is the denominator. Now, you'll remember we've said on a couple of occasions in the past that return on capital uh, is effectively the same thing as the free cash flow. Free cash flow is a subtractive equation operating minus investment cash flows. Return on capital is operating divided by investment cash flows. So we cross out return on capital and replace it with free cash flow. They are equivalent to each other. In other words, we build a model to the best of our abilities that captures both the investment and the operating cash flows going forward. Having got this uh, financial plan, the free cash flow, we then discount it back to a present value, but let's not call it the cost of capital. Because, as I said in the previous clip, um, uh, the misuse of language, the cost of capital isn't to do with what your capital costs you. It is the required rate of return. It is the pricing of risk. What return correlates to the risk to which you're exposed. So let's cross out cost of capital. I'm not going to call it the minimum required return, MRR. That would confuse people with IRR. Let's just call it the discount rate, DR for discount rate. But remember, the higher the volatility risk of that free cash flow, the higher the discount rate should be, the higher the return that I should want. Conversely, if it is a relatively stable, non-volatile free cash flow, it will be a lower discount rate. This then uh, produces the value, uh, uh, net present value, NPV. So there we are, we have the formula for what's called discounted cash flow valuation analysis. This is the dominant method methodology used in the, uh, in the business world. Uh, if I were you, I would be a little careful about applying this. It works in the United States, but in few other places, certainly in project finance and in emerging markets, um, I would not adopt this approach. Because the big weakness uh, in this formula is that discount rate. Uh, let's imagine that I have a Paraguayan fertilizer plant. Uh, it's the only fertilizer plant in Paraguay, and it's Paraguay, for heaven's sakes. Um, so where did that discount rate come from? If I see you do a DCF valuation analysis with the MPV as the output, I'll be the troublemaker at the back of the room, because I know where your Achilles heel is. Your ability to justify that discount rate, you will not be able to empirically justify it. Uh, you've just stuck your finger in the air. But that's okay. Mathematics teaches us that if you have three parts to an equation and you know two parts, you can solve for the third. It's called algebra. And financial modeling teaches us that you should always leave as the output of your model the thing in which you enjoy the least confidence. Uh, and in a Paraguayan fertilizer plant, the thing I have least confidence in is the discount rate. So it ought not to be an input to the model. It should be, indeed, the output. So, let us approach it this way. We build the free cash flow projection uh, as before. I have no problems building a, a business cash flow for a Paraguayan business. Uh, I, I know what my unit costs are, labour costs, uh, interest rates, tax rates. I can do as credible a financial projection for a Paraguayan company as for an American or a German company. We then lock in the MPV to equal zero. 
And then we use the model to solve for the discount rate when applied to that cash flow projection will produce an MPV of zero, neither positive nor negative. And that is called the internal rate of return. The IRR is the discount rate when applied to a cash flow project, free cash flow projection gives you an MPV of zero. Now, if the IRR for my Paraguayan fertilizer plant, um, if the IRR turns out to be 60%, six, zero, uh, I don't know what it has to be for Paraguayan fertilizer, but uh, for heaven's sake, that's a green signal to me, on the assumption that the inflation in Paraguay is 2 or 3%, uh, that, that's a green signal. Um, now, it's only, that 60% is only as good as the credibility of the input assumptions that I use to generate that free cash flow projection. But as long as you are confident that those input assumptions are credible, then 60% is a go signal. If the IRR is 2%, I don't know what it has to be for Paraguay or fertilizer, but stop wasting my time. It's only when the IRR comes in around 20%. Well, I don't know, what do you think? Uh, you see, computers don't make decisions. Human beings do. A computer is a tool that allows you and I to make decisions. And the problem with human beings making decisions is that we're all full of prejudices and preferences. You, you may feel that 20% uh, for Paraguay uh, is fine. I, I disagree with you. Um, if it's 20%, I prefer to do our Bolivian opportunity. Now, it sounds as though uh, I'm saying that if I'm your boss, uh, we're going to Bolivia, and if you're my boss, we're going to Paraguay. But I actually believe that if we were an investment committee, if there were five or six of us, or an investment committee, and we cannot unanimously agree, then don't do the deal. Don't squander your finite human and financial resources on marginal transactions. So if the transaction is in that borderline area, keep your powder dry uh, and, and wait for the definitively value-creating opportunity to come along. Because as I say, your resources are finite not infinite. Um, now, uh, you'll remember that uh, I have distributed some books and one of the books I distributed was called Behavioral Corporate Finance. And it goes through some fascinating insights of how decisions are made in real life. You see, I, if I'm investing my own money, I can choose to keep my powder dry and wait for this definitive opportunity to come along. But if you work for a company and you keep declining to do marginal deals, when you come up for your annual review with your boss and your boss says for the last three years you haven't done any deals, uh, if you say, well, I attended this seminar and the guy said, keep your powder dry uh, and wait for, do you know what's going to happen to your job? Do you know what's going to happen to your whole team? In other words, uh, people are under artificial pressures, budgets, targets, achievements, bonuses, uh, that corrupt, with a small c, uh, corrupt uh, rational uh, decision making. But if it was your own money, I think you would not squander it on a marginal opportunity. So we've talked about uh, two ways in which you can run DCF, uh, either with the MPV as the output, or the IRR, but there is a third way that we could approach uh, the analytical task. Let's imagine that our company has the opportunity to invest in, purchase or build uh, a washing machine factory in Tajikistan. The idea that we're going to do a 20-year cash flow projection of washing machine sales in Tajikistan, are you kidding? I can't see 20 days in the future, let alone 20 years. The investment is speculative, but that doesn't mean to say we can't do some financial analysis. In other words, we're going to build a model uh, where the, the business plan is the output. You see, normally uh, with a financial analysis, you start off with how many washing machines you're going to sell. Uh, you then go through unit costs, uh, you know, uh, tax rates, uh, interest rates, and so on. 
and out of the bottom drops the IRR or the MPV. But we can start at the bottom with the IRR. In other words, you and I, the five of us, let's say, in our investment committee, we sit around the table and identify what rate of return would we require to compensate us for the risk of uh, going forward with this uh, Tajikistan venture. Now, there'll be no empirical basis at arriving at that figure. It will be uh, uh, judgmental. Um, in other words, for the purposes of our diagram, let's assume that we have resolved that uh, the pricing of risk, in other words, the required rate of return for our Tajikistan venture is 47%. Now, of course, this presumes that our company, this does not, this level of risk does not go beyond our risk tolerance threshold. Everybody has a risk tolerance threshold, a point beyond which no amount of return compensates for the risk. Uh, uh, we then insert 47% uh, uh, at, uh, at the bottom of the analysis, and then we to do a reverse cycle model, we work backwards. Instead of working out with the number of washing machines at the top, um, we start with the IRR. We know what the unit costs are, tax rates, interest rates, and the output of the model is how many washing machines must we sell in each and every period. The only thing that's different in a reverse cycle model is that because we all understand the time value of money, uh, clearly, if we penetrate a market quickly, uh, we would not have to penetrate it so deeply to get a given IRR. Conversely, if we enter the market more deliberately, more slowly, then we would have to end up penetrating it more deeply to get the same IRR. So we have several, five or six different uh, profiles of market penetration. But for each of these profiles, uh, in each column of the model, it would identify how many washing machines we would have to sell. And if the model is telling us that if you achieve 47% for that purchase or, or build cost, every household in Tajikistan must own five washing machines, then I think the model is telling us this is not a good opportunity. Conversely, if the model identifies that we would only have to achieve a 1% market share in order to achieve a 47% return, then that sounds pretty good to me. You'd have to understand a little about the market to interpret the results. Now, the, the, the project is still speculative, but what the model or what the analysis is now identifying is how high the high jump bar is for our business plan. And you and I can look at that and say, well, do we feel comfortable with achieving that aggression of business plan in order to achieve our required 47% return? So it's still speculative, but it can still be subject to DCF analysis, the third method of analysis, the reverse cycle model.